a very good morning to all of you i welcome you all to ansarkari so like every day we'll be analyzing the newspapers different newspapers and important articles from the perspective of the upsc civil services examination so let's start today's analysis so most important news has been regarding h3n2 flu it claims two lives and both the patients they had comorbidities and there are around 451 cases confirmed in the country so far this year. Patients, they show symptoms similar to those of COVID-19. And it is time to mask up again. So with flu cases rising across the country, Health Ministry has advised people to wear masks and follow social distancing. So it is very important to ensure that this virus does not spread. So please follow the proper guidelines. And there are like up to 15,800 of these patients, they were hospitalized with severe acute respiratory illness. And there are 450 confirmed H3N2 cases over, they were seen this year. And the symptoms includes fever, cough, breathlessness, wheezing, and also like signs of pneumonia and seizures have been reported. So India reported 9.66 lakh cases of flu in 2023 itself. So at least two persons, they have died of the H3N2 subtype of the seasonal influenza, which has infected rising numbers of people since mid-December. And after a nationwide surveillance exercise, the ministry said that it had found at least 450 confirmed cases of H3N2 virus. So that's there. And... Prime Minister flags attacks on temples in Australia. So we've been talking about India-Australia relationship and we covered this topic comprehensively yesterday. So reports of temples being vandalized in Australia worries the Indian Prime Minister and he welcomes uh, his Australian counterpart, Anthony Albanese. And he said that India and Australia had a close partnership, but the recent attacks by the pro Khalistan outfits on the Hindu temples had disturbed New Delhi. So China helped Saudi Arabia and Iran restore their relations. So regional rivals Iran and Saudi Arabia, they agreed to restore the ties and reopen their diplomatic missions in Chinese brokered talks. So you can see that whenever like if we are talking about Central Asia or we're talking about the Indian Ocean, China is trying to assert itself and trying to increase its role wherever it sees the opportunity for the same. So Riyadh, basically capital of Saudi Arabia, they had cut ties with Iran after the Iranian protesters attacked Saudi diplomatic missions in Islamic Republic in 2016 following the Saudi execution of Shia cleric Nimr al-Nimr. So since 2016, there basically the relations, they had been not in good terms with each other. So the issue of crashing onion prices and also the potato prices, it's a serious issue and this would be raised in the parliament as well, coming from the Nationalist Congress Party's chief, Sharad Pawar. So we've also talked about this topic. So President, she's been there in January and during their convocation. So she said that Janu must remain steadfast to its founding principles. And apart from that, so she told the Jolan Edu University students that university's vision, mission, and objectives articulated in its founding legislation includes national integration, social justice, secularism, democracy, international understanding, and a scientific approach to society's problems. So all these are keywords and 
important for us to remember all of these. So the university community must remain steadfast in its adherence to these founding principles. And the university presents a lively reflection of the cultural unity of India amidst the diversity. So students from many other countries, they are also studying in JNU and thus JNU's attraction as a center of learning goes beyond India as well. Coming to the editorial page. So, the unchallenged run of majoritarian encroachments. So, in a recent speech, senior advocate in Supreme Court of India, Dushan Dave, he expressed his anguish at the seeming co option of independent institutions to the will of a powerful executive. So, Mr. Dave constructed, he construct, contrasted the passivity of the Indian civil society and public institutions with the protests that have paralyzed Israel. So a comparison has been made between these two and these protests, they are the widespread demonstrations that have broken out against Israel's right-wing government over its stated plans that are aimed at restricting the autonomy of the country's Supreme Court. And the parallel with Israel made in the speech, it does illuminate a necessary precondition for the healthy functioning of democratic institutions. So here, uh, when we're talking about independent functioning of the democratic institutions, you can talk about the Election Commission of India and what the changes being made uh, when we're talking about the appointment of the Election Commissioner and uh, basically Chief Election Commissioner also. So that is important functioning of ED, CBI, all of these becomes very much important when talking about their independent functioning. So this precondition is the existence of a civil society base which fortifies the political legitimacy of autonomous uh, institutions in their confrontation with an overbearing executive. So in Israel, the civil society base in support of the Supreme Court is made up of the professionalized middle classes who zealously guard their individual liberties. So in the absence of a written constitution in Israel, it is this social base which has kept mainland Israel a relatively free and democratic space. And meanwhile, the right-wing parties such as Benjamin Netanyahu, whose populist nationalist Likud draw their support overwhelmingly from the economically marginalized and the less educated segments of the Israeli society. So that's we can talk about the civil society in Israel and its composition. So the difference in India, so unlike Israel, Hungary and Turkey, where resistance to the populist right wing has come from the educated middle classes, the in, in the Indian case, it is a peculiar because the middle classes there, here they have tended to be its most resolute ideological backers. So as a Lokniti survey of uh, 2017, it noted that the educated classes that displayed the greatest penchant for coercive violence on dissenting individuals and along with a higher level of empathy for dictatorship and suppression of speech than found among the cohort of the illiterates. So B.R. Ambedkar once explained the importance of a liberal secular civil society to an American radio broadcaster this way. So he said, the roots of democracy lie not in the form of government, parliamentary or otherwise. The roots of democracy are to be searched for in the social relationship in terms of associated life between the people who form a society. So that's how he defined or he explained the importance of a liberal secular civil society. So has uh, such a civil society base evolved in Indian democracy over the last seven decades or not? And in several states of northern India, the collective retribution of bulldozer justice, stringent laws over the conspiratorial fantasy of love jihad and the unremitting stream of police encounters have certainly shown up the hollowness of the social and institutional support ungirding our constitutional order. So um, that's there and... So democratization in UP and Tamil Nadu. So basically this lack of space affordable to an independent and oppositional civil society has plagued not just the Congress vision of democracy, but also later models of democratization that came up to channel challenge its hegemonic 
rule. So it's important that the civil society is aware, it is democratized, it has basically, it. there is a certain gap where it can, you know, independently protest against the just inequalities or the just reasons. So that is, we are saying that is, we, we can say that either that is subsiding or that is lacking, lacking in Indian case. So we can summarize here two such contrasting routes of democratization. Firstly, the Mandal route in Uttar Pradesh and Dravid Manitra Kasgam, that is DMK route in the Tamil Nadu. So here it is talking in the context of the political party. So we'll not go into that. So Indian civil society, it remains hierarchical and fragmented, desirous more of integrating itself into the ruling power structures than challenging them. So that is a major trend and therefore any resistance to majoritarian encroachments on our constitutional order is not likely to come from civil society formations or the independent institutions that rely on their support. Unlike the Israel case where we talked about that there basically middle class or civil society, it forms of the educated people who are protesting against basically a restriction over the Supreme Court's power. So belated, but it is essential. So here we're talking about the regulatory response to the surge in the virtual assets that is cryptocurrency. So recently we saw that the money laundering acts basically would be now applicable when we're talking about the regulation or monitoring of the cryptocurrency transactions in India. So here we have the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. So it is much needed and even if it is belated a step, but yet it has been taken up even if lately. So the government has been struggling in recent years to formulate an appropriate regulatory response to deal with the pandemic era upsurge in advertisement soliciting investment in virtual assets as well as reports of actual investments. So definitely we saw that uh, the investments or we can say the traders in cryptocurrencies has exponentially grown during this period. and. Here we have the numbers as well. So even if this is like discounted as a speculative guess, uh, guess estimate, so measures and disclosures by the government indicate that the volume of trade in unregulated virtual assets, it has grown sizably in recent years. And you have seen a number of crypto exchange brokers also coming up. And we have also had a case of Vazirx where it was charged of insider trading. And uh, then talk about the uh, Intergovernmental Financial Action Task Force, which is the Global Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Watchdog. It has been continuously flagging the potential that virtual digital assets have for the criminal misuse. So we have also seen instances globally how ransomware attacks, they have been demanding cryptocurrency in exchange. So they are being used even in cyber attacks. So considering the speed and the anonymity with which they can be traded worldwide. So that is the reason why even the attackers and the cryptocurrencies are being increasingly used for criminal purposes. So as it is opted out, it is sorry, as it has pointed out, the fact that a few countries they have moved to regulate their virtual assets and some others they have even banned them outright, while a majority they have not taken any action has uh, like created a global system with loopholes for criminals and terrorists to abuse. So majority of the countries they haven't taken any action for cryptocurrencies and their usage or the regulation or monitoring of the transactions carried out in cryptocurrencies. So that is basically that is the loophole or that is the space that the criminals and terrorists are kind of abusing. And in India, which holds the presidency of G20, it has been repeatedly stressing the need for a globally coordinated regulatory response to deal with crypto assets. So while the center's decision to add the PMLA monitoring requirements following the introduction of a tax regime for the virtual digital assets in last year's budget has been interpreted by the crypto asset sector as move towards regulating rather than proscribing it. So the RBA's consistent advocacy for a ban needs to be seriously weighted before any decision is taken on the fate of the long delayed draft legislation on the virtual assets. So we we, we are like very clear about what has been the RBI stand as far as the cryptocurrencies is concerned. So they say that they very clearly say that cryptocurrencies and their usage needs to be completely banned in India. However, a ban was also introduced, but that was set aside by Supreme Court. And talking about 
So here, yesterday we talked about what is the legal position of cryptocurrencies in India. So that was one case. And apart from that, uh, we, we have also introduced 30% uh, tax on the gains that are made from the investments or trading in cryptocurrencies. And apart from that, we have also introduced 1% TDS. So that is the case. And that is, we can say that that is the legal status. And this is the most recent one that they would now be regulated under the money laundering apps, which are implemented in India. So here it is talking about AUKUS in Australia. So the week ahead, it is likely to be crucial for Australia. So an announcement about an optimal pathway for AUKUS. So its members includes Australia, UK and US. So that is a, it's a security partnership between United States, Australia and UK. And it is on the horizon, uh, horizon. So with implications for Australia's plans to operate a fleet of nuclear powered submarines within the next decade. So Australian Prime Minister is called it the single bi biggest leap in defense capability in Australia's history. So officials in Canberra, they're still concerned about this. So their country requires a favorable path to develop deterrence capabilities against the potential adversaries. But even the most positive outcome of AUKUS consultations is not without drawbacks. So even there are certain drawbacks when we're talking about AUKUS consultations in the meetings. So the main issue for Australia is that many of its regional partners, they oppose the Royal Australian Navy operating nuclear attack submarines so basically uh, australia does not have support of other countries as far as the operation of nuclear attack submarines is concerned so few of them include indonesia so they have been open about their reservations regarding this decision of australia and others such as india despite being politically supportive of AUKUS, appear conflicted about the prospect of these submarines operating in the regional littorals so that is going to be a challenge for Australia and the soon to be announced optimal pathway for AUKUS has implications that go beyond Australia and its near neighborhood. So here it is also talking about what are the options available for Australia. So basically, the first is that which Australian officials, they hope, will be the chosen pathway. So it is for the U.S. to build nuclear-powered attack submarines for Australia. And as much as Canberra would like it, many U.S. policymakers, they seem spectacular about this option. So this is one option in front of Australia. Second is that top U.S. senators, they wrote to President Joe Biden in January this year, urging him not to sell the nuclear submarines to Australia, warning that it would jeopardize the U.S. national security given the vessel's scarcity. And that's there. And uh, the, sorry, the second option is for the U.K. to expand its astute class program to Australia. So here too, uh, there is a hitch that the UK is constructing its dead not class ballistic missile submarines program while designing the astute class replacement in a sequential build processes. So even if Australia acquired an astute class submarine integrating the onboard combat system, that would be difficult due to the differences between the current Australian and the American fleets. So there is a second option. And the third is the perhaps most likely option is a trilateral effort to develop a new nuclear submarine design. So coming together of all the three countries is the best suited option in this case. But even there are certain challenges, even uh, if the third option is adopted. So the biggest show, which is that Australia has to figure out how to get around U.S. export controls. And critics, they say that a U.S. stringent export control and the protocol regime could jeopardize the technology transfer agreement, particularly in areas related to undersea capabilities and the electronic warfare. So that is the case. And... Definitely the developments with AUKUS, they are then, they are well, well worth watching even for India as well. So China's massive Hainan bet. So Beijing is relying on unlikely destination, which is a lush tropical island to launch or what some hope will be the second round of reforms and open up the Chinese economy. But the jury is still out on whether the bet is uh, whether the, this bet would 
payoff in the Xi Jinping era or not. So some there are some of the ambitious plans with with which China might be coming up and obviously what would be the challenges for India or for other country and even for some of them would be there for China. So you can uh, have a look at the location. It is located around Hong Kong, we can say, Henan. And that's there. So a free trade port represents the world's highest level of opening up and demonstrates that China's doors will not close, but open wider and wider. So 40 years ago, China stood at a similar crossroads that 1992 Deng Xiaoping, he embarked on a southern tour to give his stall reforms a second wind from Shazan, Shenzhen, uh, just three years after the events at Tiananmen had shaken China and the world. So Xi appears to be taking a leaf out of the Deng playbook when the right after last year's NPC session. So here, basically, they are trying to make a free trade port at Henan. So there are experiments underway regarding the same. And let's see if we get much more news about it. So we'll take up later. So Mumbai-based gaming firm, it moves Madras High Court against the CB CID notice. So the investigating, uh, investigating agency, it had sought answers to 26 queries in connection with the probe into the case of a rummy player having killed his wife and two children before dying by suicide itself. So here uh, for us, what is important is that we need to be aware about the online gaming industry and what the regulations that the government is planning for and if it is like already under some regulation what is law so all of that needs to be very clear so rescue efforts of india in turkey and syria have been lauded so modi stressed the need to evolve the local models of housing and town planning as per the new technologies as far as the disaster risk reduction is concerned in the context of earthquakes so local models of housing and town planning as per the new technologies. So he was basically inaugurating the third session of the National Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction and said that the global appreciation for the work of the Indian rescue teams in earthquake hit Turkey and Syria recently has made every Indian proud. And the National Platform for the Disaster Risk Reduction, it is a multi-stakeholder platform constituted by the government of India to facilitate dialogue sharing experiences, views, ideas, action-oriented research, and explore opportunities in the area of disaster risk reduction. So with the main theme of the event being building local resilience in a changing climate. So he said that the concept was a familiar one in Indian tradition, and it was clearly visible in the wells, architecture, and even the old cities in India. So in India, the system solutions and strategy of disaster management have always been local. And he gave an example of Bunga houses of Kutch that survived earthquakes to a large extent. So Bunga houses, basically, again, talking about an example, a case study, and a basically surviving example of the importance and the strength that rest in the local models. So he stressed the need to evolve local models of housing and town planning as per new technologies and recognition and reform. They are the two main components for strengthening disaster management. So recognition and then reforms accordingly as per the needs of the time. So that's what is important here. So there is a drug, basically, this is the drug which is used to treat H1N1. It has been recommended by World Health Organization for the treatment of H3N2 cases as well. And the drug is made available so the public health system free of cost right now because we are seeing the increasing cases of H3N2. So 
So categorization of terrorism into good or bad on the basis of the motivation is dangerous because terrorism is terrorism. You cannot categorize into good or bad. That's absolutely meaningless. And India said that tendency to categorize terrorism on the basis of motivations behind the terrorist attacks that can be dangerous and asserted that all kinds of terror attacks, whether motivated by Islamophobia, anti-Sikh, anti-Buddhist or anti-Hindu prejudices, they are condemnable. So basically uh, it was being held by India's permanent representative to the UN. So she said that the international community needs to stand guard against new technologies and false priorities that can dilute its focus of combating the scourge of terrorism. So uh, that's there. And so she was basically, she said this at the first draft resolution, first reading of the draft resolution on eighth review of the global counterterrorism strategy. So underlining that there cannot be good or bad terrorists, she said that such an approach will only take us back to the pre-9-11 era of labeling terrorists as your terrorists and my terrorists and erase the collective gains the international communities has made over the last two decades. And moreover, some of the terminology such as the right or the right-wing extremism or Far right or far left extremism opens the gate for misuse of these terms by vested interest. So we therefore need to be wary of providing a variety of classifications which may militate against the concept of democracy itself. So India also asserted that states that provide shelter to the terrorists, they should be called out and held accountable for their deeds. And this is obviously kind of a reference, indirect reference to Pakistan. So the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy, it is a unique global instrument to enhance the national, regional and international efforts to counter terrorism. So it is important to protect the secular nature of the strategy and India condemns, India strongly condemns all kinds of terrorist attacks irrespective of religion, belief, culture, race, or ethnicity. So yesterday we also talked about that India and US are going to launch a semiconductor subcommittee so this is a step where india is trying to reduce its dependence upon china as far as semiconductor chips imports is concerned and it is also important that we we'll, we need to set up the manufacturing plants of semiconductor chips which are majorly used in the automobile sector and we saw how you know dependence uh, and completely relying upon one country can impact the industry during the covid-19 pandemic so the key features of the commercial dialogue included creating reliable supply chains, diversifying and friend shouldering, facilitating climate and clean technology cooperation. So this is between India and US. And recently, there is also one new initiative regarding the critical and the emerging technologies between India and US. So that will broaden the strategic technology partnership between the two. So India, Australia, they also sign audio-visual co-production agreement and under which the private quasi-government or the governmental agencies of the two countries enter into contracts to produce films together. So help the cow shelters market dung-based formulations for farming. And this is from Niti Aayog. So cow shelters, they can address the problems of wandering cattle that feed on or they damage crops in many parts of the country. So goshalas, they can become major suppliers of inputs for the natural farming in the country through concerted efforts of the government. Private players and entrepreneurs, 
and the report was titled as Production and Promotion of Organic and Biofertilizers with special focus on improving the economic viability of Baushalas. So that's how that is one of the ways through which the natural farming, the organic farming and the zero based budgeting farming can be promoted where Gaushalas can have a very, very important role in this whole thing. So the agriculture in India, it was based on this integrated approach, but after the green revolution, uh, we could not maintain this balance. And we saw that the use of chemical fertilizers brought imbalance in the soil nutrients. An off-late realization has been growing to reduce or replace the agrochemicals serving as plant nutrients and plant protection for economic, health, environment, and sustainability reasons. So uh, accordingly, there's also a trend towards natural farming and organic farming where inorganic fertilizers and agrochemicals are replaced by the livestock manure, plant-based products, bio-inputs, and products made from the cow urine and cow dung also. So that is a kind of a shift and we can say awareness amongst the farmers. So this thing is growing, but uh, we need to uh, like ensure that the government, the private sector and the Gaushalas, they come together in order to give it a boost. So more girls, they join STEM. So it is science, science, technology, engineering and mathematics courses in India than in US and UK. And the number of girls studying up to high school and beyond has tripled over the last decade in India. So say that the enrollment of girls in STEM in India is at 43% today, which is more than in countries such as US, UK, Germany. And that is something which should grow further. Apart from that, moving to the global page. So President Xi Jinping begins his third term as president in former control. So Pakistan is in perfect storm of crisis as per their finance minister. So Mr. Bilawal Bhutto Zardari said that uh, his country is facing a perfect storm of troubles and economic crisis, the consequences of catastrophic flooding and terrorism that is once again rearing its ugly head. So when we're talking about reviving, uh, reviving activities of terrorists in or terrorism in Pakistan. So there is the important role of Tariq Taliban Pakistan, which is, you know, causing different suicide attacks in Pakistan. Once we saw that the Taliban regime was back in power in Afghanistan. And obviously there is political instability at the same time. So be it climate change, be it economy, be it polity, everything is in trouble in Pakistan right now. So U.S. closes down the Silicon Valley Bank. This is the biggest bank failure since 2008 crisis in U.S. So investors fear that other banks could face similar losses as they look for ways to raise cash. So this is really very concerning and it, it would definitely have impact globally. So U.S. regulators shut down Silicon Valley Bank in a spectacular a spectacular move that sent the global banking shares into turmoil as markets they fretted over the possible contagion from the biggest banking failure since 2008 financial crisis. So U.S. authorities, they swooped in and seized the assets of the bank, and which is a key lender to the U.S. startups since 1980s, and that is there. So it is to be seen that what... Uh, in what position are other banks in right now? Because obviously, even when we talk about the global economy, the situation is not that good, or which does not make it much more confident. And after that, we are also seeing a biggest bank failure after 2008 crisis in US. So definitely, this is a cause of concern for us. 
So January industrial output rises 5.2% and expansion in the output was measured by the index of industrial production, which is bolstered by a double digit surge in electricity generation for the third month in a row and growth in manufacturing production was also witnessed. However, it remained tepid at 3.7% despite a low base in the year earlier period as well. So despite that, we are seeing that it is not grown by a higher amount or by much, it is not much, much difference. And there's an uptick in the index of industrial production. So you need to tell that, do we have index of industrial production even for services sector or not? So manufacturing production has weighed down by the textiles and electronic sectors, according to the Bank of Baroda's chief economist. And consumer durables output has also contracted for the second straight month. And consumer non-durables also shrank by 5.7% because of a weakening consumption trend. So textiles hurts the output in manufacturing growth. So as you can see, as I was saying that because of that bank failure in US, obviously that would be impacting globally. And you can see Sensex, it slides 1% on banking stock sell off as US rate increases the loom. So that is also one of the reasons how USA is impacting the Indian capital market and their performance and their everyday performance, I would say. So sentiment has been bruised by the recent Fed statement that more rate hikes are on the cards to check inflation. So obviously, if US would be increasing the Fed rate, that would be the case in India as well. And then we see that U.S. job growth beats the expectations in February. So on the one side, that the concern is about the increase in the rate hikes. And on the other side, we are seeing that the job growth is performing nicely. So that is kind of, a, we can say, balancing things out. And the U.S. economy added jobs at a solid clip in February, like uh, ensuring, likely ensuring that the Federal Reserve will raise the interest rates for a longer though wage inflation it showed signs of cooling so ultimately uh, inflation is not under control we can say and it is not anywhere near the target levels be it us or be it india coming to financial express so Adani may sell 4 to 5% in Ambuja cement for $450 million. So this is kind of a, it is uh, going to be a good relief for the banking sector who had exposure to the Adani group of companies. And that's there. So even this is a kind of a positive decision by the Adani promoters. And index of industrial production growth inches up to 5.2% in Jan. So in this graph, you can try to understand how the IIP has been performing and it is again kind of an increasing. So let's see what is going to be the trend forward. But right now it is rising. So we have seen about the shutdown of a Silicon Valley bank in US. So the quality of detailed project reports has been flagged by our Union Road Transport Minister. So he said that I am in the mode to take a decision to allow international companies to make their detailed project reports and giving them priority. Though I am not of that opinion because of not so good DPRs and a lot of problems they are being faced in this thing. So it is very important that before launching any project, uh, uh, the, uh, it is important to assess its quality and the DPRs, they need to be honest, they need to be very transparent and also they would be held accountable if uh, any loophole is found or there is any kind of mischief being done. So India used the vote to strengthen the technology and innovation ties. So they also signed a pact on semiconductors. This was already seen. They acknowledged, so both of them acknowledged that the bilateral goods and the services trade has almost, it has doubled since 2014 between India and US. 
So larger economic pact with India this year, and that is between India and Australia. So progress made on migration and mobility pact as well. And they agree to a greater cooperation in defense and trade sector. So we have uh, recently signed the Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, which is expected to cover 90% of the bilateral trade between the two countries. So that is one thing. Bumper harvest pulls down onion potato prices that leads to distressed sale. So retail inflation, you can see how it has been performing. This is for potato and this is for onion. So onion, me though it is in negative territory, but in case of potato, you can see how sharply it has fell. And that is obviously causing distress amongst the farmers community. So onion inflation, it is a negative zone for a long time period. So fragmented globalization, we are entering an era of globalization characterized by substitution and not negation. So as the world increasingly divides into blocks, globalization stands to become more inflationary, reducing the potential growth. Avoiding this outcome depends on how national governments and multilateral institutions navigate the new economic reality and the changing world order at the same time. We see that globalization so far it has made markets work better policymakers they lost sight of its adverse distributional consequences and many communities and countries they were left behind contributing to a widespread sense of marginalization and alienation at the same time also so it is we can say it has also caused a kind of imbalance at the global level where certain countries which did not participate that much when we talk about globalization And the result was obviously a backlash against the globalization whose most visible political manifestations were the United Kingdom's vote to leave the European Union and Donald Trump's election to the United States presidency in 2016. So soon the United States, it has also entered a tariff war with China, deepening the divide between the two economic powers. And obviously we're also seeing that USA is now kind of adopting more protectionist policies and strategies as far as the global trade is concerned. So it is moving back to the old regime and Western consumers, meanwhile, they have increasingly pushed back against the human rights violators and countries that harm the environment. And um, the invasion of Ukraine, it has also led to unprecedented sanctions on Russia and the weaponization of the international payment system. So it follows then that many would conclude that globalization has ended. But rather than a sharp reversal of the past 30 years, it seems far more likely that we are entering an era of fragmented globalization characterized by substitution and not negation. So the sanctions regime imposed on Russia is a case in point here. And over the past year, the US European Union led restrictions, they have not materially reduced China's oil exports, but redirected them elsewhere majorly to China and India. So we are seeing that it is kind of a substitution and there is no negation. And basically what US and Europe expected that sanctions would be kind of hurting the Russian economy, but that's how the things have not been. And Russia would have, we can say it has not been impacting majorly by the sanctions. And apart from that, when we talk about rupee internationalization and rupee-based trade, so even India is a kind of 
focusing much upon that in the context of trade with Russia right now. And in that context, again, watch show accounts become very much important for us to understand, to know about their working. And that's there. So national and global policymakers, they need to thoroughly revise how they can think and operate. And long-term investors absolutely should incorporate more sophisticated geopolitical, sociopolitical, and environmental analysis into their allocation strategies going forward. And while there may be some who consider the phrase that fragmented globalization is an oxymoron, I believe it is the most probable scenario for the global economy. And as the world increasingly divides into blocks, a few more fluid than most others, the globalization stands to become more inflationary, reducing the potential growth. So avoiding this outcome depends on how the national governments and multilateral institutions, they navigate the new economic reality. And the world may not fully deglobalize, but that does not mean we should assume smooth sailing ahead. So definitely here, that, that is, uh, we can say that Fragmented globalization is the upcoming challenge. Finally, coming to the Indian Express. So we've already seen this thing. So the big drivers of manufacturing growth, they were electrical equipment, beverages, motor vehicles, trailers, semiconductor, semi-trailers, but experts, they want that the manufacturing pickup, it could be a one-off case as the base was low and it may not sustain. So key takeaways between India and Australia, defense and security is underlined as pillars of strategic ties. Cooperation in maritime ties, defense, renewable energy, trade, and education. Understanding on wrapping up of the comprehensive economic cooperation agreement as soon as possible. So these are the major takeaways. All these uh, political news, let's move forward. So in this picture, you can see 10 lane Bengaluru Mysuru Expressway. It will be inaugurated by the Prime Minister. So that's how basically you can talk about how we are focusing upon capital expenditure on constructing infrastructure, be it roads or, you know, ships or different ports, airports. So I can talk about the major expressways being constructed at the national level. So respect and equality for women are key to India's progress. And he was uh, addressing a post-budget webinar in New Delhi. So we also like uh, celebrated, we talked about the role of women basically in India. And there was also one compilation that was released by Prime Minister on his Twitter account, talking about the important role of women in different areas and their major and important contributions as far as the society and the local pro local problems and challenges are concerned. So we celebrate the International Women's Day on 8th of March. So we should know that. And Respect and equality for women, they are key to India's progress. So India can move forward only by raising the levels of respect for women and the sense of equality. And I call upon all of you to move forward with a determination to remove every obstacle coming in the way of all women, sisters and daughters. So that's there. And he said that women had been increasingly taking on the new roles, whether it was flying the raffle fighter aircraft or the recent election of two women MLAs to Nagaland Assembly, a first. So this is for the very first time a woman, two women have been elected as MLAs to the Nagaland Assembly. And he said that the enrollment of girls in STEM that has reached 43% level, which is more than countries like United States, UK and Germany. So he said that 70% of the beneficiaries of the Mudra loan scheme of the government, even they were women. So that's how you can substantiate how women are basically rising in India and that too in diverse roles.
so india is going to host the seo summit this year so here you need to know about what all members are a part of seo summit and pakistan it attends the meeting online so that's there it's moving forward So talking about the local government, so it is not so local government. 30 years after the 73rd and 74th Amendments of 1992, decentralization of power is more showy than real. So basically, the author is trying to say that what these two amendments talked about, they have been not implemented effectively. Like they've been showing, but the, really they are the when we talk about decentralization of power, that has not been achieved so far after 30 years of these two amendments. So the Indian government's was uh, government governance was always over centralized, and but it is a sign of the times that even the modest steps these adept, these amendments took towards decentralization, they now seem to belong to an alien intellectual and political world. So Indian democracy since independence never really had a commitment to decentralization despite performative options to the idea by the state decentralization has always been hostage to a number of contradictory impulses. So initially there was the presumption that centralized power would be required to break the power of the local elites, never mind the fact that there is little evidence that the outcomes of decentralization would have been worse than what we eventually got. So the ideology of the Gandhian decentralization oddly enough militated against the genuine political decentralization. So local government, they require many technical, administrative and financial fixes. There is a case to be made that the distinction between 73rd and 74th amendments is now obsolete. And Jalalitha, when she was a chief minister, had first made the case for a unified district level local government rather than a distinction between urban and rural. And many of the decisions consequential for the India's urbanization, like land use change, for example, they are being made in panchayats. So there is arbitrage over how a settlement gets classified and rural and urban is now at best a continent. So that is one reform that it is the article is talking about. And these amendments, they did not achieve a lot. So in some areas, they led to the state acquiring a distinct presence on the ground and they gave millions of citizens identities as representatives. They provided a conduit for sharing power. They created deliberative spaces, led to the creation of new norms, especially around the participation of women and a churn in local elites. So they slowly built up the local capacities and led to a wide range of functions being devolved to the local government. So obviously the experience of local governments has been different across states. So it is more deeply practiced and institutionalized in states like Kerala. But as the articles in a recent symposium on decentralization, the March issue of the seminar magazine pointed out that the glass of decentralization still remains at best half full. So the tension between thinking of the local government as mere administrative conduits versus the autonomous political actors, the constraints placed on them by a combination of the bureaucratic control and the deliberate under, under investment in their capacity and there is lack of political path pathways for the successful panchayat performers to rise if their parties limit their salience. And then technology has been a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, it can create local capacity and on the other it has been used to largely bypass the political negotiations and the control. So the lack of clarity over the municipal governance and the hijacking of the cities by the people by the political economy of contradicting makes the idea of cities being governed by some sort of collective deliberation a bit of a joke. So the non-seriousness about the 73rd and 74th Amendments is a lack of seriousness about democracy itself. So proponents of decentralization, they now have to contend with three large uncomfortable facts. 
The first is that despite significant changes brought about these two amendments, has the needle on demand side of decentralization moved much? Second is which is the constituency or movement that will put its weight behind the local governance? And lastly is or will any incremental reforms we get remain like in 1993, a product of accidental conjectures easily blown away with the first whiff of the resistance. And oddly enough, even in cases where the local governments, they have the power, are they willing to exercise that power or not? Secondly, the guiding philosophy behind the decentralization was a faith in the institutions. And these were meant to be the pathways to inclusive growth and active citizenship. So you cannot have inclusive growth without inclusive governance. So that is very important. So went uh, the mantra and it was a part of a range of reforms that sought to you know, redesign the architecture of the Indian state, but the state would be better served by decentralization than centralization, transparency instead of obesity, public reason instead of administrative discretion, local capacity instead of the co concentrated authority, active participation instead of the subject status. So this is a nice sentence. So what all would be much more, you know, strengthening the Indian democracy. So grassroots democracy, grassroots governance is very, very important here. So we even talked about what is safe, uh, safe harbor. So basically it is it is one of the main reasons behind the meteoric rise of the internet giants such as Facebook, which is defined the web 2.0 era. So for, you need to be also knowing about what is web 2.0. So uh, here we're trying to understand what actually, what do we mean by the safe harbor clause? So it says that basically uh, the intermediaries which are the social media platforms and whatever content is posted on uh, the social media platforms by the third parties so those intermediaries they are not going to be responsible for whatever content is posted there because uh, by the third parties so that is kind of a safe harbor for those intermediaries for the social media platforms So talking about the landslide atlas of India, which states, regions, they are most vulnerable. So here we discussed about the, uh, the disaster risk reduction, what steps are important, basically local construction techniques, as we talked about as the prime minister is emphasizing upon is much more important whenever we are like talking about earthquakes or even landslides also. But uh, here we're talking about the landslide atlas. So... So according to the statement, the climate of India 2022 released by the IMD. So this says that in 2022, heavy rain, floods and landslides claimed 835 lives in the country. And this uh, landslide atlas of India, it is published by ISRO. So this is very important. You can get directed to this and this can also come up in prelims. So landslide atlas is made by the ISRO, that is Indian Space Research Organization. So what causes landslides? Obviously, there can be natural reasons. There can be anthropogenic reasons behind these things. And how are they mapped? Obviously, we are using technology. We are using satellite mapping to formulate this atlas so understanding here there are 30 districts most vulnerable to landslides so most of them are the the top one are in Uttarakhand so Rudraprayag and Teri Garhwal in Uttarakhand they're most vulnerable to landslide then in it is in Kerala Thrissur then Rajori in Jammu and Kashmir Palakkad in Kerala Ponch in Jammu and Kashmir so on the top you can say uh, the, when we talk about the states so the most vulnerable states includes Uttarakhand Kerala and Jammu and Kashmir and likewise, obviously, the most of the states are the Himalayan states. There is Sikkim, and then we're talking about the Western Ghats. So that is there. So here we're talking about the total districts which are most vulnerable in any particular state. So it is one of the highest in Mizoram, followed by Tripura. And then we have states like Jammu and Kashmir. So Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory. 
and we have also Uttarakhand. So Mizoram followed by Uttarakhand, then we have Tripura and then Jammu and Kashmir. So that's all for today. Thank you for joining in Sarkari. I hope you have understood all the topics properly that we discussed in detail. And you'll be also getting the PDF link in the description box. So do not forget to go through that PDF because that would be also helping you in retaining things. And apart from that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel if things are helping you out. And please hit a like button for this video and share it as much as possible. And thank you so much for joining us for today.